ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌಲಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವಿಳ್ಯಂ ಕರವಾಯಿ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಸ್ತು ಮಾಷವಾಯಿ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 Om, may the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all your beloved children everywhere. Oh, dear one, make it so, make it so, make it so, Hari Om Tat Sat. Well, namaste, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening gathering to, reading, to read and discuss the book, Realizing God, a collection of talks by Swami Prabhavananda, assembled by his loving devotee Nandini or Edith Tipple. Uh, they cover uh, talks given by the Swami on the same subject from the 1930s to the 1970s. and truly amazing compilation of the thoughts and loving aspiration of the Swami that we each and every one realize God, which is why Nalini chose the title. Now there are seven admonitions or Mahavakya's great sayings at the back of the book. She didn't see anywhere else to include them. So she just created a special page for them. Yes. Without uh, any discussion or commentary from here, but anyone who wants, uh, anyone of you who wants to say anything, please, uh, Haima, would you read those seven sayings of the Swami that are such good Very. advice for us as Very. aspects I agree with you brother shankar it's on page 467 very profound statements by swami prabhuananda i will read them before i start the whole thing good evening and namaste everybody happy valentines day to all of you my yoga teacher always said loving self is never wrong at all loving self is wonderful the more we love ourselves we love the world around us better and better thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read it is 467 we i'm going to read those profound statements by swami prabhuananda so long as we feel we can do it so long god remains hidden as you proceed further you will say i don't understand anything until the darkness goes away there is the light of brahman i know it's hard to hear but as i have repeated many times over the years there is absolutely no one who is your own but the lord people have a right to their pain and suffering don't try to remove it sustain and comfort the secret of meditation is fourfold the chosen ideal is you yourself no different learn to feel that living presence number 2 patience three perseverance and four expectation in if each one of us would see ourselves as the atman the true self and look at things of the world objectively 
everything would pass by and be all right. Last one. At the moment, we become completely freed from cravings and we are overpowered by the one desire for God. That very moment, God becomes revealed to us. Brother Shankara, can I read one more time or just? Please, as you sure. This, yes, these are seven profound statements. So long, number one, so long as we feel we can do it, so long God remains hidden. Number two, as you proceed further, you will say, I don't understand anything until the darkness goes away and there is the light of Brahman. Number three, I know it's hard to hear, but as I have repeated many times over the years, there is absolutely no one who is your own but the Lord. Number four, people have a right to their pain and suffering. Don't try to remove it. Sustain and comfort. Five, the secret of meditation is fourfold. In that, one is the chosen ideal is you, yourself, no different. Learn to feel that living presence. Number two is patience. Three is perseverance. Four is expectation. And the sixth profound statement is, if each one of us would see ourselves as the Atman, the true self, and look at things of the world objectively, everything would pass by and be all right. Number seven, at the moment, we become completely freed from cravings and we are overpowered by the one desire for God. That very moment, God becomes revealed to us. That is the, those are the seven statements, Brother uh, Thank you for doing that. Beautiful. And thank you for reading it twice. Any comments from your own wisdom or experience or any concern or question that any of this that she just read uh, gives rise to you, for you? Anything at all? Good. They are very plainly said. Mm -hmm. And uh, each one is very, as, as is typical of Swami Prabhupada, very clear. As I said, Nalini found these in letters, people's diaries, things that had been vouchsafed to her uh, for exactly these purposes, for her to find these teachings uh, so that she would be illumined herself as to how the Swami's mind ran when a particular situation presented itself. And so she selected these seven out of who knows how many hours of readings of private letters and diaries and things that had been left to her. Uh, and so what a treasure. Mm -hmm. What a treasure is this book, number one. It is. And then what a, what a special treasure she left for us in the last page of the text of the book. So uh, if there is nothing uh, that anyone would like to comment on or uh, express a concern about, then we can start the next topic, which I don't remember from last week what that is, but uh, uh, Haima will soon tell us. I just have one comment, Brother Shankara. I agree with you. This is truly, a, I feel this is truly a book of revelation and a life's Bible for self-discovery and self-actualization. That's what I wrote in front of the book. So when I die, my kids can read it at least. I said, you know, excellent book to understand spirituality and God. It's a great resource. That's what I wrote on the first page. 
and and how right you are here. It is just just very nice book and those seven statements the sixth one brother shankara right now we really need to apply this if each one of us would see ourselves as the atman the true self and look at things of the world objectively everything would pass by and be all right because there is so much going on in the world today yes as we are living and breathing there is so much going on around us if, if you take everything underneath the skin we can't sleep, so we just have to look at objectively. That's really, it It helps all of us, I think. There is yeah. only one subject, all else is object. This yes. is such a wonderful pun, what he wrote. Yes. Look at everything objectively. See all that is not subject, which is the divine, is the only subject, the only thing of true substance. Everything else is an object that That's arises, right. persists for a time, and passes away. Yes. And so when we look at things with that frame of reference, which he refers to as objectively, then as Ima just pointed out, they don't get under our skin. Never. Because they will eat away at you if you allow them to. They slide away. We must not. Because they are that which is of the phenomenal universe that arises, persists for a time, and passes away. The very definition of a relative reality, not the true reality of our being. Nothing is personal, says Wayne Dyer. So we can't let it go underneath our skin. We just have to develop the Teflon mind and Teflon skin. You know, yeah. I've been paying a lot of attention to how everything starts as soon as the mind says, I or mine. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. like, it's literally, as soon as that happens, everything, all the wheels start spinning, everything comes into existence. But as long as that mind and ego doesn't, if it doesn't say I or mine, that ego doesn't come up and the Maya doesn't start. Like, you know, I don't know. It's just, I don't know how, how you beautifully, How beautifully and excellently said, which is the absolute definition of spiritual practice. It is, it directs our attention. It directs our being away from I and mine to thee and thine. And <clears throat> as you say, the, the wheels of the machinations of Maya and the, the ego do not start. Not at all. Uh, very good. Well, very well said, Bhagavan. Thank you. Yes. Can I start the book, Brother Shankara? If Excuse nobody has comments. What page are we on? And oh, Lynette has a comment. Please do go ahead, Lynette. Hello, everyone. I missed you last week. I was in Minneapolis hey. and the time got away from me. Yeah. Um, the one that is uh, people have the right to their pain and suffering. Don't yes. try to remove it, sustain and comfort. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That, that really. It is truly very profound. Really profound. Yes. Yeah. Tell, tell me. Tell me what your reaction is to that, Lynette. How does how does that well, how does uh, that relate to your personal experience? Because when you see someone suffering, you want to help. You know, you know, you want to help them. Are you are you are you don't want them to suffer, right? I I was back in Minneapolis. My my cousin was passing away, and I really felt that this um, mindset really helped me to release him. You know. Oh, yes. Give the right to release people to their, you know, to yes. appreciate who they are and give them permission and to release them. And so, to be and I think, with your and love. it's hard. It's hard to see people suffering. It's hard to know that they're suffering. But um, don't try to remove it, sustain and comfort. I think that was it's, that kind of mindset really uh, helped me. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes. Yes. 
there's something I heard that's a long time ago that always stuck with me, and I think it's kind of a Buddhist saying, but it you know basically says that that suffering is the fire that burns away the ego. And okay. I've always remembered that, you know. And so, you know, yeah, the, the we suffer and we have to suffer in order for that fire, that desire to be intense enough to undertake what it takes to um like something I've been studying in the imitation of Christ, what it calls the unmortified spirit. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, I realized how much of an unmortified spirit I have and that you go, you, and I realized a lot more about Christianity too in that, that I didn't realize before. And I caught this one little thing where it says, you know, we, where they're talking about why they view themselves as fallen and why they think it's far better to view everyone above you and you beneath them than the other way around. And he said that, you know, we, we feel this way or we, we take this position, even though we know it's not so. And that little part is the part that I've never heard before. And I realized that their whole thing is they believe that in this, you know, rightfully so, the, the unmortified spirit is the greatest impediment to spiritual progress. And therefore, all that, what that sufferous type movement back then, it was really somewhere it got lost, but it was in order, they knew that, that they were divine, but yet they took that stance in order to to humble the soul to keep it from getting out of check very well said but, and very well observed of the book uh, it's important for us to I don't know if it's important but it's in, in, interesting and useful for us to remember that when Swami Vivekananda took, undertook his years of wandering north to south east to west in India. He carried only four things with him. His wearing cloth, his water pot, a copy of Bhagavad Gita, and a copy of the Imitation of Christ. And he studied the Imitation of Christ and uh, brought it up on the Christmas Eve uh, of 1887, uh, during which the informal organization of the Ramakrishna order of monastics of monks was started and uh, was encouraged uh, the other young men who were with him to study that book. And he studied it right to the end of his life. You can see this uh, in his letters to, mm. to his uh, friends and followers. It's a, apparently one of the most profound books of Christian teaching. Anything else from anyone? Thank I, you, Barbara, us as always. I, I just wanted to get back to that phrase that for me, the realization that you can't take away other people's suffering because that's unfair and it's selfish. Yes. Ah. It, it's uh it does not that is true denies all the dignity of of who we are as as individuals i love yes. the use of the word dignity dignity yes, yes. Uh, we have the dignity of of our suffering because it is and does the things that bhagavan das was yes. just talking about it mortifies us and therefore decreases the fog uh, of, of misunderstanding and ignorance that keeps us from knowing our true original spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Anything more? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank you for your contributions. To me, it seems to unfold as you know, you get this realization of of the love and the Atman, the Satchit Ananda within. 
but then you always start then you also start to realize the suffering of all other beings yes and then you have that dark you know night of the soul kind of feeling where you you're i, th I don't know i'm gonna try this out on you for the first time brother but it's almost like you start having apocalyptic visions and and but you also realize that the totality is perfection. Give me, give me a, a, a description of an apocalyptic vision. Well, of very, um, of of like seeing timelines that are that are, um, and what I've what I've kind of figured it out is is what it is is it's the ego that is scared. The, mm -hmm. the ego is having like an apocalyptic moment. And mm -hmm. so I think it tells the body and the mind to panic. You know, when, when you were talking about the, the fear response comes from the body at dying. See, I've actually felt that. And it's not until you feel the ego actually believe that it's going to die. And then all of a sudden you have this really huge response out of the body. You know, it may it may come different for different people, but I don't know. I had an asthma attack so bad the other day. I thought I was I thought that was it. And mm -hmm. I felt the ego thought think like I think I'm really gonna die here. Mm -hmm. And then you feel that panic, you feel it send the signal to the body. And mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, it's but it's kind of like you know, one time we were talking about in Revelations that it's not talking about like what in mainstream Christianity thinks in the West where it's going to be like, you know, like end of the world kind of stuff. But it may be the end of the world for you and your ego. <laughs> well, I, that I think is the whole point of that book. And so I'm kind of thinking, is this the why you have these type of thoughts and visions? Is it apocalyptic? visions stemming from the ego being fearful well if if that's what's true for you why even begin to think of denying mm. everyone is different each one of us is unique and so as these things as we uh, as these things come to us and we assimilate them and we become what is necessary to actualize them. Each one of us will be different in our uh, ways of uh, responding <clears throat> and reacting, which we see so clearly in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, if you read that book, when you read that book, you see how, though his basic message is the same, he delivers it differently to different people, very different. Uh, and so they, because he sees clearly how they're able to, going to be able to hear it and receive it and make it their own. Mm -hmm. And there, of course, this is the same thing that Christ, you know, Christ is accused of contradicting himself. So is uh, Walter Whitman, <laughs> and Walt Whitman's uh, uh, response was so classic. I contradict myself very well. I contradict myself. I contain multitudes, and each of those multitudes will have a different response. Well, you know how the Buddha explained it. He said that, you know, if somebody's fixing to run off the road on the right hand side of the road, you tell them to go left. If they're fixing to run off the cliff on the, you know, left hand side of the road, you tell them to go right. Each one is true in its own circumstance to yes. guide the person back to the middle. Doesn't mean that they're wrong. <laughs> exactly. This whole idea of wrongness is is inauspicious and inappropriate ignorance we think of ignorance we don't know we're going to run off the cliff to the left so someone uh, 
helps us with our ignorance and says, don't do that. Come back to the middle. You know, the, uh, you, 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 this is very apt what you just said. So, and of course it's going to be apt. It came from the Buddha, <laughs> who was, <laughs> whose vision was as clear as, as any a great teachers can be. This is a wonderful conversation. Anything else from anyone about any of this? All right. Okay. This is I was thinking that uh, what you told us about the, the gospel of uh, Ramakrishna and um, the teachings of Jesus, what they really impart with us and share us is, is the tale of their own um, their own physical demise in a way, you know, uh, Ramakrishna was, uh, had a fatal disease, you know, and Jesus Christ had a very tough, <laughs> awful ending. Well, he, he had a fatal disease too. His was uh, complete honesty and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the inability <laughs> to, to misrepresent. Living the said. truth. And it signed his death warrant with the... Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Right. So that I, I appreciate what you just said because it makes these texts uh, even more incredibly rich because they're, uh, yes. they're yeah. their journeys, you know. Very much. That's why they persisted all these years. That's right. That's why they persisted all these years. Their richness as uh, was brought up very early in our conversation by Bhagavan Das in talking about that book, The Imitation of Christ. Yes. I mean, the richness of what Christ had to say. Thomas Akimpas minded and minded and minded and minded. And uh, that's why Vivekananda was still studying it mm. in the last years of his short life. You know, he had a copy of that book in the room with him where you know, Christianity at that level is very Vedantic. You oh, know, yes. it's like, you know, but all religions, when you get to the mystic people that really understand it, they're all they're all that way. Well, that's it's why all it the says same the, truth. That's why the ten thousand year old scripture, the Rig Veda, it says truth is one. Sages call it by many names. They speak of it in many languages. In, very, in various times and climes. This is what Vivekananda said. That's what it meant. In various times and climes, um, you know, it needs to be spoken of in a, a, in a way that is understandable and auspicious for that time and place. And so that's why all the di different teachers come. And this is what Krishna says in the Gita. Whenever virtue declines and vice prevails, I shall body myself forth and come among you to restore righteousness, to destroy the sin of the sin, and to restore you to the ability to understand if you will listen to me. And that's what each one of them says. Listen to me. Oh, please listen to and this is what we'll hear from Swami Prabhavananda uh, as we read this book Realizing God because he talks about all of these great teachers and principles that in their own way are saying listen to me make this a reality for yourself and you will free yourself from your pain and suffering not that the pain and suffering of the body, mind, and senses won't go on. Yes, that will go on. But you will not suffer in that way. You will see it for what it is and be able to rise above it. Which is the promise of spiritual life. All right. Ready to read? Okay. Getting back to our book, Realizing God, we are on page 168 at the bottom. That's where I'm going to start. We just have two paragraphs. Finish and then go to Shankara. Next one. 
right now we are in Christ. That's the last two paragraphs. I will read from food. Page 168 again. Food does not mean only what we eat through our mouths, but what we gather through all our senses. <clears throat> it is not by stunning our senses or canning our bodies that we can achieve God. Caning, caning, uh, not canning, but caning. Caning. That means striking ourselves with a cane that. across the back, which is a, okay. one of the uh, practices that was used particularly by the medieval yeah. uh, Catholics. Okay, I'll read that again. It's not by stunning our senses or canning our bodies that we can achieve God. Move among the objects of senses and at the same time, learn to give up attachment and aversion. That is the secret. For instance, a young man sees the face of a beautiful girl and immediately wants to possess her. He becomes attached. Instead of seeing that surface beauty, see how God dwells in that. And you will see your whole outlook change. As you think of God within yourself, you learn to think of God existing everywhere in all beings. That is how the food becomes purified. Then there comes purity of heart. There are two commandments you are all acquainted with. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul with all thy strength and love thy neighbor as thyself. When you love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, how can there be any attachment for something else? And then when you love your neighbor as yourself, you will see the same God dwelling everywhere that is the end of the chapter Christ any and, uh, beautiful admonitions it is you know what beautiful admonitions read those last two admonitions again what right. we, or focus our attention commandments. On. there are two commandments you are all acquainted with Love thy Lord, love the Lord thy God with all thy, thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. When you love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, how can there be any attachment for something else? It, it, isn't it, can't we see the very simple logic of that? Mm -hmm. If we do direct our attention, as Jesus' commandment says, there can be no attachment for anything else. There simply isn't any room for it. Yes, we, we become, you know, we, we experience the world, and we experience it as Jesus said, be a passerby. You simply right. see it, experience it, and leave it behind. And then the second one, dear. And then when you love your neighbor as yourself, you will see the same God dwelling everywhere. That's the end. Yeah, and because if you see yourself clearly. Yes. You see that it is that it is the divine that is manifesting as yourself. Not that the soul is in the body. The body is in the soul. The body is created by the soul. And so when you see clearly that this shining soul is the truth of yourself, then you can see clearly that it is the truth of everyone else as well. And you can truly love the, thy neighbor as thyself. 
And because it's the capital S cell, mm -hmm. there's only that one low for that cell. So beautifully and logically. It, it is. Uh, first stated by Christ and then isolated and presented to us by this one. How, how priceless. Maybe you know the exact verse, but it's basically like what you do to the least of me, you do unto me, or Christ is talking about, you know, if the that down and homeless person is Christ. And yes, even as you know, you do, that's what he's saying. But then he also later said, you know, says that you'll receive as you've given, basically. Yes. And so it's it's kind of like we're the on, we're the one who decides our our future, so to speak. Oh yes, and exactly. And the thing is, is is like in what you know you, you were just reading about do unto your brother, or you know whatever, because he is you, even as you do unto the least of them. Yeah, so you do unto me. And so once you realize, well, it is you. And uh -huh. what you give to the rest of you, you get back from the rest of you, basically. And that's even on a low transactional level to where you could just become completely absorbed in just being the witness of doing for God. And this is that we just finished studying Christ the messenger. And those points, both of the points that you just made are made and underlined by Swami Vivekananda in that talk. So yes, it's it's all there. It's said to us over and over again in many times and places by many different voices, all in the hope that we will listen. As Sri Krishna says in the Gita, mm -hmm. all I really want, all I really need for you to un is for you under, to understand who I am and what my task is. If you come to understand, truly understand, not intellectually understand, but understand from your inner being who I am and what my task is, you will not be compelled to take rebirth. That's all that's required. Now, it sounds so simple. But to really understand who these great teachers are and what it is that they're offering us when they offer us their hand and say, I will pull you up to this level. You give me your hand. You let me take your hand. Oh, Lord, take my hand. Oh, Lord, lead me on. Oh, Lord, draw me near. Oh, Lord, fill this heart. Without thee I may fall, without thee I may stray. Thou art my all in all. Oh, Lord, fill this heart. Thou art my all in all. So we we pray to be given the gift of grace to understand these things. And as we do, freedom becomes more and more a reality rather than a word we say, an idea we have. Freedom from what? Freedom from limitation, from the bondage of the ego that uh, Bhagavan Das was talking about earlier. Anything else from anyone? All right. Let's I will start Shankara chap chapter. It's a small chapter. Shankara was born in the 7th century AD into a very Orthodox Brahmin family. He became a saint, a philosopher, and a great poet. 
anyone who learns Sanskrit and reads what he wrote will find how simply and in what a melodious way he explained the most abstruse subject of his philosophy. His birthplace was the village of Kaladi in Kerala in south, southern India. He was a child prodigy. When he was only six years old, he memorized the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. Later, of course, he wrote commentaries on all of them. As a young boy of seven, he would hold discussions with great scholars of the age who would come from distant lands to see this child prodigy and discuss philosophy with him. But gradually, he became disgusted with scholarship. He realized that all these great scholars and teachers spoke lofty philosophy, but their life examples were different. They were materialistic and pleasure-seeking. At this period, his father died. So Shankara began to think deeply about the problems of life and death. Of course, he had studied all the scriptures by that time and knew intellectually how to attain immortality. In his youthful zeal, he wanted to realize the truth for himself and to set an example for others on how to spiritualize life. He wrote a beautiful poem called The Shattering of Delusion. In, in it, he says, Behold the folly of man. In childhood, busy with toys. In youth, bewitched by love. In age, bogged down with fear and always unmindful of the Lord. The hours fly, the seasons roll. Life ebbs, but the breeze of hope blows continually in his heart. Birth brings death, death brings rebirth. This evil needs no proof. Where then, O oh man, is thy happiness? This life trembles in the balance like water on a lotus leaf, and yet the sage can show us in an instant, how to bridge this sea of change. The sun may bring thee suffering. Thy wealth is no assurance of heaven. Therefore, be not vain of thy wealth or of thy family or of thy youth. All are fleeting. All must change. Know this and be free. Enter the joy of the Lord. Seek neither peace nor strife with kith or kin, with friend or foe. O beloved, if thou wouldst attain freedom, be equal unto all. End quotes. Notice at the end, beautiful. All as the beloved. Yes. O beloved. If Would you read those last lines again? Yes. Seek neither peace nor strife with kith or kin, with friend or foe. O beloved, if thou wouldst attain freedom, be equal unto all. You can be equal unto all when you see the reality, capital R, the truth of their being in all. That's how you can be uh, even-minded and uh, e equal eyed see all this the same. Any comment, concern, or question from anyone? I like this, Brother Shakra. Seek neither peace nor strife with kith or kin, with friend or foe. I know we experience so much in life. Oh, by yes. to. You know, when, when we were ignorant, we always think 
and our mom, kith and kin. And friends and, and friends. Yes. And there it's are many. Best to be objective. We not share our point of view. And uh, so it's, it's easy great advice. to uh, either uh, uh, fall into disagreement with them, which yeah. is, of course, inauspicious uh, yeah. to do, or to try to correct them, which is even worse. That's true. Mm. That's true. So, so we just, we just, we try to be even minded. Yeah. Just be, be aware from our own experience. Yes. yes, they are just perfect as they are. That is the divine being who it is being as that person at that moment. And it is none of my business to, uh, to agree or disagree with it or to try to correct it, but simply to address it as my beloved. And when you do, when you do that truly and sincerely, address others, mm -hmm. whether you say a word about it outwardly or not, address them as the beloved and relate to them as the beloved. Oh, how it transforms your relationship with them. They're glad to see you coming. They're sorry to see you leave because you are someone with whom they feel truly comfortable. And this is how we feel in the presence of these great teachers. So to the to the whatever limited extent we can reflect that same radiance from the mirror of our hearts. The more welcome the world will be. Uh, the welcome mat will be out for us. Uh, whichever way we turn. Shankara learned this way early, Brother Shankara. It took many of us some time going through the roller coaster ride of life. Then we learned it. Some of us learned it. That is the way to live. Just not to have peace, not strife. But Shankara the, being the prodigy, it seems like he's born with this knowledge. Well, indeed he was. How with, else? With this he... wisdom. When they say that he he memorized the yeah Upanishads at age six already he ah. came he simply manifested Gita and he translated them and and wrote commentaries on them by the time he was sixteen years old he had written all these great commentaries yes and, uh, and so he negotiated with his mother because he was only supposed to live till age sixteen. Mm -hmm. It, it, he negotiated with his mother that uh, he could live another 16 years if he would promise to be there at her death, which uh, he, he fulfilled that promise, of course. Mm -hmm. And so he lived another 16 years and continued to teach. So he didn't even live as long as Vivekananda. Vivekananda lived until 39. Yeah. Uh, Adi Shankaracharya uh, lived only until age 32. But the, the volume of his work is just astounding. And is, uh, as was pointed out by Swami Prabhupada, he was a great poet as mm -hmm. well as a great essayist and, and commentator. You know, the word in Sanskrit is basha. Yes. He wrote bashas on many of the great scriptures. Uh, but then he also wrote these beautiful poems, including a song called Bajagovindam, sing, yes. sing the name of the Lord. Very popular in India, Bajagovindam. Yes. Yes. So this is the this is the great Saint Adi Shankar Acharya. There, is there more or was that all? Oh, there is so much more. Yeah, there is a few more. Yeah, yeah. There are many legends that gathered around Shankara's life. It's very difficult to know whether they're true or not, but I'll mention one. When he was young, his mother had to walk a long distance to bathe in the river. He felt sorry for her and wanted the river to turn its course 
and come nearer to her house. He went out and prayed to the river. The legend is that the river turned its course in a zigzag way and came around just by his home before again joining the course. Wow. I have been to Kaladi, where he was born and saw with my own eyes how the river changed its course in an opposite direction. Isn't that something? It is amazing. But this is why it's said in the Christian scriptures. Yeah. Faith, even as, as, as faith even as a mustard seed. Yes. You will move mountains. It moves the mountains, exactly, exactly. Wow. When he was eight years old, as he realized the vanity of life, Shankara begged his mother to allow him to renounce the world and enter into monastic life. The widowed mother had just this son, so it was only after great entreaty that she gave her permission with the promise that before her death, he would come visit her. Shankara kept that promise. He went out in search of an illumined teacher. He went to the river Narmada, where even today there are huts where holy men live and practice spiritual disciplines. My master also lived there for quite a few years. According to legend, Shankara approached Gaudapada, Gaudapada is great saint and philosopher who was absorbed in samadhi. When he woke up, he knew this young boy would be coming to him. He said that he was not accepting disciples anymore, that the boy should go to his chief disciple, Govindapada. Shankara did so, and in a short period, he attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi. He stayed in that samadhi for six days and six nights. It was then his turn to go out and teach. He went to Benares, still a well-known place for scholars and holy men. There is an interesting story about this period, which is not legend, but fact. It seems that Shankara still had some caste prejudice though he had attained the highest samadhi. Caste prejudice is very strong in Kerala. I never saw it until I went there. While we were still moving on the road, it got dark. We heard a peculiar noise and, I went, and when I asked my friend what it was, he said, oh, they are untouchable. They are the untouchables. They make that noise to find out if they are, there are caste people walking on the street. If so, they move away. I said, don't make any sound. Let's not tell them we are caste people. Let's approach them. But this inferi inferiority complex was so inborn in those people that as we approached, there were about a dozen of them and we were only three. Half of them jumped to one side of the field and the other half to the other side. One of the men whose guest I was, was very rich. I told him he had to invite those untouchables for some good food and good clothing. He did, but the untouchables sat far away. I asked them to come nearer inside the house, but they would not come. So I tricked them. I ran and got hold of a baby, so they followed me into the house. Later, the zamindar, the landlord, opened a school and boarding houses for boys and girls, and another friend of mine became the headmaster. He was a very educated man. He became Swami Tyagishananda, who wrote a beautiful and learned commentary on the Narada Bhakti, Bhakti Sutras. Now, with the influence of the Ramakrishna mission and Mahatma Gandhi, untouchability has become illegal and is not observed anymore. 
but Shankara had that caste instinct in him. As it happened, as he was going to bathe in the Ganges, the road was blocked by an untouchable with four dogs playing around. Shankara ordered him out of the way. The untouchable, in a very gentle manner, addressed the dogs. Look, you don't even know what intelligence you have. And he ask, asks us to move. He says there is one Atman. Where is one to move? Where is the place? Is not all filled by one Atman, one Brahman? Isn't that what he teaches? And he says to move away. Suddenly it dawned on Shankara. And he saw before him that this Chandala was none other than Lord Shiva and the four dogs were the four Vedas. After that, of course, Shankara. Yes. This is not apocryphal. This is a true story. Yes. This actually happened. He did. Yes. And so what a what a beautiful. I mean, it's just overwhelming. It sure is. It just you know, this great soul who'd been to the heights of Samadhi, the Rikalpa Samadhi, mm -hmm. still had this caste prejudice. Exactly. And so Shiva contrives to find a way to dispel it. Not in any harsh way, but in this gentle, very nice fun way. Yes. Talking to these dogs. Exactly. It's so, so charming. It is. It's so wonderfully. He gets. lets you know how the Lord will educate us mm -hmm. if, we'll, if we'll be attentive. So that made me think of kind of a weird point or weird question on this. And that is so. When when the eye comes out and the ego comes out, and then instantly we start writing this story, the script, you know, explaining the eye and the ego and how we got here and where we're going and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so there really isn't a past. The only past is the story that that this Maya is writing, you know, with with the ego. And so is it the samskaras that influence how that writing takes place? And is that why he still had some uh, caste bias? That would be that would be a very accurate uh, surmise from from where I sit, uh, Bhagavan Das. You know, he still had the samskaras of of his past lives as we all do i mean he he wasn't uh he wasn't an avatar that has has no mm. such cars mm. I mean, he was born with with a lot of knowledge a lot of you know it was so there was a lot he just brought a lot with him including uh i think you correctly surmised these these uh, samskaras, these impediments to uh, wisdom. That yeah, the, a, the reason I was saying that is, is because if you're if you're taking the standpoint that there's only now, and that you know, as soon as that I comes into existence, and then we start writing that script and that story, but there really is no past, and so the there is no karma so um my reasoning would be that it would have to have come from like a samskara affecting the way that the maya was being produced for him to have that it's so, it, that's what so, I, I think that's an accurate okay reading. yeah well i wasn't sure about the no past thing you know because that well, kind of i'm not sure about it either dear <laughs> <laughs> i'm not at all sure about this past, present, future business. I mean, it seems to us that there is a past. It seems to us that there is a present moment. And it certainly seems to us that there will be a future that 
the rest of this hour will complete. We'll finish the class. We'll say goodbye to one another. We'll see one another again when we see one another again in whatever circumstance. We, don't, we believe in all that. Otherwise, why would we be here? But is it a reality? I, I, I simply don't know. It's it, it's a shared reality. We've agreed to this contract. <laughs> very good, Lynette. Yeah. Very, very good. It is a shared reality. It is a contract to which we have agreed. Yes, I think that's precisely right. That caste system existed for a long time in India, Brother Shankara. Now things have changed tremendously after Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi had made the untouchables as Harijan. Harijan means God's children. Hari right. is God, Vishnu. Jana is people. They are God's people. So they named them as Harijans. Then it started slowly, slowly changing people's attitudes as they got educated, got into higher positions that slowly, slowly faded away. And I'm sure in some areas where you go to villages and some places, maybe it's still there, but it's it's so much better now. The caste, caste system is there, but this untouchable part was really cruel when I was growing up too. Oh, so yeah. it was very bad. We that's, didn't... That's yeah, we, we made such a point of it in his writing about this coming into this village and him. It was really bad. Yeah. And all that. I mean, it, you know, this is, this is a, this is Swami telling us a true story of his yeah. own adventure. Exactly. Exactly. Our time is up. Uh, I just have five lines and then I'll stop. And the next week we can start with this chapter again, with this Great. paragraph again. How about that? That sounds good. Okay. After that, of course, Shankara had no prejudice. He wrote a famous poem, the refrain of each verse being, he who has learned to see that the one existence everywhere is my master, be he Brahmin or Chandala. That's it. That's the paragraph ending. Chandala means really low caste. Brahmin is he where he's born, Brahmin. Mm -hmm. They used to call them Chandala, which is horrible. We'll take that, all that up again. Yes, we will start with that paragraph next time. Thank you, Brother Shankara. Time is up. Well, <clears throat> Om Hari Om Om Hari Om Om Hari Om Om May we May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may that divine being whose name introduces itself as mother and father. As in the verse that opens these sessions. May we know that that mother father being holds us in a loving and secure embrace. May we be well and in bright spirits. Uh, this being Wednesday, the next opportunity we'll have to get together um, will be Saturday for our beginning of studying uh, the Sermon on the Mount according to Vedanta. And then on Sunday, a woman named Clarice will uh, offer us a talk by Zoom on nonviolent modes of communication, how to be who you are and get what you want without doing violence to yourself or to others. It's a fascinating uh, study and uh, one that she is a spokesperson for, not the originator of, although she has uh, put her own spin on it. And she's a great, great friend of Elizabeth Yates, Jyoti Ma. So that's why she's speaking to us. And then, of course, in, at the beginning of March, we'll have Swami Yogatananda with us. Not to be missed, either in person or by Zoom. 
however you can manage it. Anything else from anyone as a last thought? All right, dears, as always, how delightful to gather this way and to be together this way. And, uh, you know, the, Thank you, Brother Shankar. We didn't yeah. get a lot of the book read, but that's not the point. The point is for us to learn together and to study together the art of spirituality. Yes, Linda, what did you? You had something to say, Linda? Linda. Just a uh, happy heart day. <laughs> happy, happy heart day. day. Happy heart happy day. Happy Valentine's Day. Yes. Bye bye, everybody. Portland, Bye. Portland, Maine. It is said that the city of Portland, Maine is covered in red hearts. Uh, that, that's uh, the, uh, the uh, Valentine's Day bandit covers the city of Portland, Maine with red hearts. Mm. Uh, one wakes up on Valentine's Day and the city is bathed in these red hearts. What a charming thing to do. All right, dear dears, a great good night to you.